Hi, good evening. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you here to Leeds Beckett University and to the professorial inaugural lecture of Prith Viraj Nath, Professor of Marketing in Leeds Business School, which is part of our Faculty of Business and Law. Our university is one of the UK's largest providers of professional education, training, research and development in the United Kingdom, transforming the lives and prospects of thousands of individuals and organisations every day. Our research is not just about transforming lives, it is also about changing the world, from looking at ways to tackle the biggest health issue the UK is facing, obesity, to evaluating and developing new strategies and technologies on sustainable house building. The impact we have is far and wide. This is a source of great pride for our regional and local community, but also for us. As a large organisation with 25,000 <coughs> students and 3,000 uh, odd staff, we contribute half a billion pounds to the economy every year. Our graduates are the workforce of the future. We aspire to create exceptional employees, dynamic citizens and enterprising leaders. We have more than 900 academic staff covering a wide range of research disciplines. And in tonight's <coughs> lecture, Raj will outline the key challenges facing internet-based retail startups, including making their website a destination of choice for customers, encouraging shoppers to browse their site for longer, and increasing the probability of purchase. He will also look at, at how e-store startups can attract prospective buyers and improve their customers' browsing experience using two tools, interactivity and personalization. After studying physics, at Jadapur University in Kolkata, India. Prithviraj completed his PhD on marketing at the Indian Institute of Management, also in Kolkata. He was assistant professor in marketing at Xavier School of Management in Jamshedpur, India, before moving to the UK to work at the University of Nottingham. In 2010, he was appointed associate professor in marketing at Norwich Business School at the University of East Anglia. And he joined us here at Leeds Beckett University in March 2015 as professor of marketing. And he also serves as Associate Director of the Retail Institute, which is the UK's only, UK's only academic research centre which leads the consumer experience of the future in retail, food and packaging. In his current role, Professor Nath is involved in several industry-based projects and leads research on the theme of consumers of the future. He particularly wants to understand how consumers make buying decisions in an online retail context. His current research centres on the use of big data and digital marketing with a focus on the retail and banking <coughs> industries. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great pleasure to now invite Professor Rajnath to present his professor, professorial inaugural lecture, What Makes Customers Click and Buy from a New Market to E-Store? Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Slade, for such a nice introduction. <coughs> Now, before I begin, now before I begin my talk, what I would like to do is uh, ask you a few questions about online retailing, and just to try to find out how exactly you are using online retail stores, what kind of things you buy, why you buy from them, and how exactly you make your decision. Now. Let me ask you, how many of you have recently bought something which is quite technologically complex from an online retail store? Now, we are not looking for stores like Curry's or PC World or John Lewis, which has a physical presence. Okay? We are looking for pure play, <coughs> stores which are purely in the online environment. So that is the thing that we are looking for in this particular study. So how many of you have bought something quite recently, like a computer, like a laptop, a mobile phone? A valve radio. Okay, that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Cathy? Um, a phone. Okay. Smartphone. Do you remember from which website you bought that? I do. Okay, so from which website? Gifgaf. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now the thing is, <coughs> would you like to buy that phone from a website like I love my mobile phone dot com? Uh, no. Perhaps not. Okay. <laughs> the reason is we are looking for the websites which are new to market, which are relatively unknown. Very few people know about them. 
The problem with such kind of new to market e-retail store is that first of all, they are not known. People do not know about them. Neither do they have enough resources to advertise their offerings. So there is always a chance of risk. There is always a fear of risk which consumers have from such kind of store. But if you look at the industry reports, you will see that a large number of e-retail stores, purely e-retail stores, which are coming up in the market, in the internet world, almost every day. And thousands of them die, all, again, almost every day. For the simple reason, people do not know about them. People feel that if I buy from such kind of retail store, what kind of product will I get? Am I going to get any kind of product? Will that be damaged? And so on. So there is a huge amount of risk which is involved when you buy from an e-retail store. But the focus for our topic is, or our talk is, how exactly we can make this new to market e-retail retail store as future Amazon. Okay, so when Amazon started, they started something like this. So the objective is how exactly we can make such e-retail store as future Amazon, as future market leader. So that is what we are interested in. Now let me ask you another question. Now when you go to buy something, either in store or from online, say you want to buy a dress, how many stores do you generally visit before making your choice, before making your purchase? How many stores do you generally Not visit? Not many to buy a dress. I have to say. <laughs> Not many? No, I don't buy dresses. Okay, you don't buy dresses. <laughs> Anyone? Like how many? About four. Yeah. About four or five. About four or five. five. Okay. And then how many dresses you really look at like uh, before you make your final purchase decision? probably be about two in each store. Two in each store. So at least around say 10, 12 different items. Now you see that again we see that some people what they do is before they make a purchase they will try to visit as many stores as possible. Either real life uh, uh, physical stores or they will visit multiple websites to see what exactly is, in, uh, is on offer at the market. So these people, what they will do is, they will try to collect as much information as possible. They will try to process all this information to the best of their knowledge. They will take time. And if the purchase is highly risky, if the purchase is highly expensive, then they will spend more time in searching for information. These people uh, have, like why these people look at such kind of information, such like a volume of information, for the simple reason, these people have a high sense of risk associated, okay? Like these people have a fear of risk. These people have a fear of regret. So that is why what they do is they try to get, gather as much information as possible before making their final purchase decision. On the other hand, some people, what they will do is, at, at least I can give my example. When I go to buy a shirt, I go to just one shop and then pick up the shirt which is there in front. That is how I make my purchase. Why? Again, there are some people like me. Of course, I am not the only one. There are some people like me who do not want to process that information. The reason could be several. Okay, like they do not have time, they do not have that kind of knowledge, or they do not have any kind of inclination. So that's a different story. So when we try to look at people or individual behavior of people, we see that some people are searching for information as much as possible because what they want is the best possible product in the market. On the other hand, some people, they do not want to search for that information, they do not want to spend that time, they do not want to put that, um, uh, that much of effort to uh, process that information because they are satisfied with something which is fine for them, for their own purpose. So they are not looking for the best possible product in the market, but they are looking for something which satisfies their requirement. Now, when we try to understand this kind of behavior in the online world, we found that this has been explored in detail in psychology to understand <coughs> human behavior. Now, those people who would like to gather as much, of, as much as information as possible, they are classified as maximizer. On the other hand, those people who do not want to gather that much of information, they will make a quick choice. They are called satisficer. So in a way, what we can do is we can classify our consumers into two different groups, one as maximizer and the other one as satisficer. Now the question is, 
when you look at any of the new to market e store or when you look at any website for example what we come across is whether i am a maximizer or whether i am a satisfier the web interface will be exactly same so when a maximizer goes to a website say you go to john lewis website you will face similar kind of website uh, similar kind of interface on the other hand when a satisfier goes to the website again they will interact with the similar kind of web interface so the question that we tried to answer was should we have a static interface for all kinds of user or should we have a dynamic interface that would change according to the user requirement so we have to understand the users have different kind of requirement so how can we make our website more dynamic according to the requirement of the user so these are some of the problems that we are trying <coughs> to address in this particular uh, uh, project or in this particular uh, paper now <coughs> what we tried to do was now before you start any research project of course you have to look at literature you have to find out what has been done before how people have addressed this kind of a problem what we found out was that there are two different tools which the website developers or <coughs> managers who are like uh, looking after the websites the retail store they have uh, with them one of the tool is called the interactivity tool and the other one is called the personalization tool now if you think of interactivity what exactly is interactivity now when you go to i'm i'm giving you an, uh, giving you an example when you go to an energy website energy company utility company website like eon like edf and if you try to look for the different offers what they are uh, offering to their customer once you spend some time immediately what will happen is there will be an online chat agent an online chat box okay which will come up so basically the role of the agent is to assist you in decision making so that is a sort of interactivity with some customers like on the other hand some customers for so that is an example of interactivity on the other hand personalization is where you can really personalize the offering which the the website is making or which the store is making you want to buy a shirt you do not want to look at all the different type of dress material which they are selling so can i personalize the website according to my requirement so that is an example of personalization tool which the customers can use so basically speaking when we think about the websites they have two different tools interactivity and personalization so the objective of this study was can we play around with interactivity and personalization in such a way so that we can make our websites more attractive we can make our websites more user friendly and make our websites suitable for different kind of users and as i said we are looking for two different user one is called the maximizer and the other one is called the satisfier how do we make the website more dynamic by using these two different tools now if you look at the framework that we try to use now trust trust is always a very very important thing in any kind of online business still we see almost every day in bbc that there are incidents where customer details are stolen so customer name their credit card details their information everything is stolen and it goes to a third party it is sold somewhere so trust is always a very very big issue the other thing <coughs> is something which is called the decision satisfaction now those of you who are in marketing we always talk about how do we satisfy our customer so satisfaction is a very very big important concept in marketing but the whole problem with satisfaction is when you look at or when you try to understand satisfaction most of the studies on satisfaction what they have done is they have tried to understand the post purchase satisfaction so you make a purchase you buy a product you make a purchase you use the product and then you say whether you are satisfied or not so that has been the traditional way of understanding satisfaction but the problem with this new to market e retailer is rarely someone will go and buy the product on the first visit right so you come across a new website you go to the website you search for different offers which they are making you like some of the offers what you are going to do is you are going to compare those offers 
with established players like John Lewis, like Curry's, depending on the nature of the product category. So, for these websites, what they are trying to do is <coughs> they are not trying to sell you the product on the first visit. They are trying to make you a repeat visitor and not a repeat buyer. So once you become a repeat visitor, what will happen is you will try to understand the website more, you will like their offerings more, and then perhaps you will make a purchase. So that is what they are looking for. So for these kind of websites, the new to market websites, the challenge is how exactly we can offer satisfaction <coughs> to our customers in the pre-purchase decision making stage. So we are not looking for the post-purchase decision making, but we are looking more at the pre-purchase decision making stage. So that is why we are trying to understand what exactly or how we can play around with interactivity and personalization to offer that kind of pre-purchase decision satisfaction. Now if you look at these two different items, risk and alternative, now we, we know the risk. Why should I go and buy a product from an unknown retailer like I love my mobile phone.com? Why should I do that? Because there is a high amount of risk involved. And the other thing which I would do as a buyer is I would try to compare their offering with other established players. So I'll go to maybe Curry's, I'll go to John Lewis, I'll go to any website I know of. And then I'll try to compare their offering with the other established players offering. So that is the meaning of attractiveness of alternatives. So as a buyer, I have several alternatives in front of me. So I can go into the store like uh, in person, I can search for the product in several online stores and then I can make my decision. So somehow what these websites have to do is they have to use those interactivity and personalization in order to reduce these two things. If they can reduce these two things, then the customers will be repeat visitor and if they become repeat visitor then of course one day they will buy a product from you. So that's the challenge which such kind of websites are facing and we try to address that kind of challenge. Now how exactly we did that? Now what we did was <coughs> we conducted something like an experiment. Now those of you who are in marketing experiment should be a familiar method to you. So we conducted a sort of an experiment. So what is that experiment? We created a online store, a hypothetical online store, a dummy online store. Now this online store, again we created four different versions of this online store, okay? Now these four different versions had different levels of interactivity and personalization. I will explain to you how exactly we manipulated those interactivity and personalization tool, but these websites, these four versions of the website had different levels of interactivity and personalization. And what we did was we chose uh, or we designed a website which was selling laptop computer. Because our target population was student of our university and laptop computer is a product which students use almost every day. So we thought of uh, to design a website which is selling laptop computer. And the way we positioned the study was, like as I said, this is a hypothetical store, okay? Like the students or the participants in, the, in that experiment did not know that this is a hypothetical store. The way we positioned the study was that this is a new to market uh, e-retail store, which is targeting specifically to student population. And then they are selling laptop computers. And they are selling these laptop computers at a slightly cheaper rate than the established rates which are there in the market. So what we did was we went through all the, like the major players selling laptop in the UK market at that point in time, found out the major brands th th that they are selling, found out the prices at which they were selling those laptops, and then we manipulated all of them in our design of the website so that our website was selling laptop computers to students at a slightly cheaper rate so that it becomes attractive to the student. And as I said, the way we positioned the study was that it's a new website which is coming into the market set up by two entrepreneurs targeting the student population and then they are doing a market testing to find out whether it can satisfy the student requirement or not. And then, <coughs> 
this was our website. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is a screenshot of our website. <coughs> we call the website as Laptop Madness. Now to conduct the study, what we did was we got some funding from our university. Okay, so we used that funding and then we contacted a web developer who developed a website like this. But we gave them the specification. We told them how exactly the interactivity and the personalization have to be manipulated. Now, if you look at the websites, what we did was we chose all the established brands. Okay, again, we took them from Argos, we took them from Curry's PC World. We had all these kind of things, okay, like it's safe to shop on this particular website. We had all those kind of things like uh, wish list, my account, and then return policy. If the product is damaged, what will happen? How exactly to return the product? And we did everything which a real life web store does. So the website that we created was exactly like a real life web store, except you cannot really purchase something. You can put some item on the, in your uh, like uh, shopping cart, but you cannot really purchase. Like as I said, we said that this is a new store which is going to be opened very soon, but now they are doing a sort of a testing. So that's why you cannot buy today. Many students were interested to buy a laptop on that specific day because the prices were around 10% cheaper <laughs> than the standard market price. Okay. So the students, <coughs> what, we, what we did was, like as I said, we created four versions of the website. And all these versions were selling exactly the same product. The photographs were exactly the same, but they were slightly different. How exactly they were different? They were different in terms of the interactivity features and the personalization feature. To give you an example, if the website has the buying guide, the product rating guide, okay, like what other customers <coughs> are saying about this particular product. You get a five star rating, you get a four star rating, three star rating and so on. So the buying guide, the product rating guide, if the version had those kind of uh, features, then it was classified as high interactivity. If the version did not have those kind of feature, it was classified as low interactivity. But the users, the students, they did not know. Like one group of students was exposed to store A, another group was exposed to store B, another group was exposed to store C, and so on. So there was no overlap between the participants. And each student or each group thought that this is the exact website which is going to be launched very, very soon. And they have to make a purchase decision. They have to choose a product, uh, a laptop of their choice. In case of personalization, if, they had a, if the website had a facility to create my account, save my information and so on, then it was high on personalization. Otherwise, it was low on personalization. So that is how we created or we manipulated these four different websites. Now, as I said, we got some funding from our university. We used that funding to design this website, pay money to the external uh, web developer number one. And to increase participation, we also gave some kind of Sainsbury voucher okay, to, the <laughs> to our students, five pound Sainsbury voucher to our students, so that they are interested to participate in the experiment. And then they give us a good uh, data. So that is how we conducted the study. <coughs> now, I'll show you some interesting results of this study. I'll just explain uh, perhaps one or two graphs. If you look at how interactivity plays a role in developing trust, and what we did, as I said, we classified our users into two different groups, as maximizers and satisficers. Now, there are established scales in psychology literature to classify your user into maximizer or into a satisficer group. So we, had, uh, we used all those scales to classify them. Now, if you look at this particular graph, if you see when interactivity is low for the maximizer, which is the green line, okay, the, the trust is again quite low. On the other hand, when interactivity increases, the trust of the maximizer increase substantially. 
On the other hand, the role of interactivity on trust is quite different for the satisficer. If you look at the blue line, which is the satisficer line, when interactivity was low, the trust was quite high, but the trust decreased. Now we have to understand why it, this is happening, why the results are showing something like this. So basically what the result is showing is the effect of interactivity is different for maximizers versus satisficers, why it is happening. Let me show you another graph. <coughs> on decision satisfaction. Okay, again the blue line, uh, uh, the green line is the maximizer. When interactivity is low, the decision satisfaction which the maximizers have is again quite low. And when interactivity increases, the decision satisfaction for the maximizer <laughs> increases. Yeah. On the other hand, the, the trend for the satisficer is something like this. So we see both the interactivity and personalization is increasing the satisfaction for the maximizer, but it is decreasing it for the satisficer. So if you remember what I told earlier that when we go to a website, when we visit any website, whether I am a maximizer or whether I am a satisficer, I will come across the same interface. So the question that we tried to answer was, should we have a static interface for everyone or should we have a dynamic interface depending on the user requirement? So that is the question that we try to answer. And we see that yes, we sh what we should do is, we should not have a static interface because the level of satisfaction will depend on your own requirement. If you're a maximizer, like as I told you earlier, maximizer will try to search for as much information as possible so that he does not make a wrong choice. Now what happens <coughs> if there is high level of interactivity? Like the example which I gave you earlier, that when you go to E.ON website, you will come up across a search box, an online chat agent with whom you can interact. You can clarify your doubts. So these maximizers would love such kind of interactivity. They would love to get as much information as possible so that they do not make a wrong choice. They have always that fear in their own mind that I am making a wrong choice. There is something else in the market which is offering me a better value for money. So Tracy is nodding her head. So <laughs> perhaps she's a maximizer anyway. Okay. So, <coughs> so you see, such kind of people would love that interactivity. On the other hand, if you look at the satisficer, the blue line, their level of satisfaction decreases when you give more and more information to them. Now the problem with satisficer, as I told you, first of all, perhaps they do not have enough time. Second, perhaps they do not have enough <coughs> knowledge. If you think of a product like this, laptop computer, maybe we are all users of laptop computers, but we do not know exactly what is going on inside. What exactly is RAM, what exactly is ROM, all the technical details of a laptop uh, purchase making, uh, decision making. So for the satisficer, they do not want all these technical detail. They want to understand whether this will satisfy my requirement or not. So they do not want a plethora of information, they do not want that kind of interactivity, but they want to narrow down their choice, right? So the more interactivity you give to them, they will become confused. We have something called information overload, right? So this is an example of information overload. So if you give more and more information to a, mac uh, to a satisficer, then he will feel that I am like overburdened with information. And what he will do is, Next day, he won't come to your website. He, he will go to another website. So we see that this finding has tremendous application for any website, whether it's a new to market website or whether it, it is an established player. <coughs> the advantage with established player is they always have a chance. They have a physical store or they have an established brand name. So people do not feel that amount of risk by purchasing from them. On the other hand, for the new to market e store, as we said earlier, they somehow they have to reduce that risk component. Somehow they have to reduce that attractiveness of alternative component and so on. So it becomes extremely critical for them to know how to use interactivity and personalization. Now, when we were looking at all these, when we, when we were trying to theorize like, what, like why interactivity and personalization has different effect on different user, 
We also tried to find out some kind of analogy with other fields of literature. Now we found something quite interesting uh, from one of the psychology papers which talks about the Greek mythical king <coughs> called Sisyphus. Are you familiar with Sisyphus? Mm -hmm. Right? <coughs> so Sisyphus, again I am not very sure about his story, <laughs> but as far as I know he was a Greek king. And then he was cursed by the God for doing something wrong. And the curse was something like this. Every day morning, he had to carry a big boulder on his shoulder and climb up a hill. By the time he reaches the top of the <coughs> hill, that was almost evening, and because of the curse, the boulder rolled down. And that happened every day. So that was his curse. He had to take the boulder every day and climb up a mountain. Now the same thing is happening with the maximizers as well. Say for example, you go to Eon today, you try to understand as much as possible, you get all like, go through the finer details of their offer. You get your information and then you decide, okay, perhaps I will come back tomorrow and then I will make my energy purchase. But when you come back tomorrow, if you are a maximizer, you will feel in your mind, perhaps there may be some additional information which has been uploaded on the website. So what you will do is, you will again go through from the scratch. You will start again collecting information. And that you will do almost every day. And when you, per when you make your purchase at the end, after making that purchase, still you will feel in your mind, I haven't made the right choice. So you are a classic maximizer in that case. And for a classic maximizer, as I said, interactivity is very good, but for a classic satisficer or a minimizer as we call them, what you should do is you should give them what they are looking for. They are not looking for offers on all possible items in the store, but they want something. They want to buy a shirt, so they want to have information only on the shirt. So for them, personalization becomes so important. So that was the finding that we got from the study. Now the whole thing is, so, so what? Now how do we use this finding? Can we really understand who is a maximizer or who is a satisficer? Now any idea like, can we, can you, like, first of all, like there is an established scale I know, <coughs> where you can, if you fill that scale, you will know that whether you are a maximizer <coughs> or whether you are a satisficer. But for the website, for the, uh, like the store manager, they do not know whether you are a maximizer or a satisficer. So how do they make the website dynamic according to your requirement? So that, that was the problem then. <coughs> now what we found out that there are perhaps two or three different ways in which you can understand whether you are a maximizer or a satisficer. And accordingly, what I can do is, if I am the manager of the website, I can make it more dynamic. First of all, I can ask my customers to register which is very normal, right? So if you want to buy something from a website, you have to register. So while registering, I can ask them to fill some extra information by which we can classify the person whether he's a maximizer or whether he's a satisficer. That is number one. Secondly, like many of you may ask that if I'm not interested to buy from a website, why should I give my personal information to the website? I want to give my personal information. So what do I do? How do I understand whether the person belongs to what kind of a, a customer group? Perhaps what we can do is we can try to understand the number of clicks that he's making, the amount of time that he's spending on the website. If you are making repeated clicks, perhaps you are looking for more and more information. You want to clarify your doubts. Then you will be classified as a maximizer. On the other hand, if you are not making so, so many clicks, or if you are spending very little time on the website, perhaps you are a satisficer. So using that click stream information, what I can do is I can try to classify you as a maximizer or a satisficer. And the third most important thing is, if you are a repeat buyer, if you are a repeat visitor, then I can track your usage. I can track your uh, visit to the website. So using that visit information, I can understand whether you are a maximizer or a satisficer. And then accordingly, I can have two different interfaces, one for the maximizers, one for the satisficers. 
So for the maximizers, what I'll do is I will try to give them as much interactivity tools as possible. So some of those interactivity tools I have shown you earlier. Right? So some of the interactivity tools I have shown you earlier. And if you are a satisficer, what I will do is I will offer you as much personalization tool as possible, something like this, with a personalized email, personalized offer, newsletter, again, which is like a classic for Amazon. So whenever you are buying something from Amazon, next day you will get an email that similar products which are on offer. So the, the, the satisficers would love to get such kind of newsletter because it reduces their cost of information search, the time for information search. So you see that what we are trying to do is we are trying to develop a different kind of interface according to the buyer uh, or the user requirement. So this is all about uh, what I wanted to say for today. Now if you have any question, if oh you want right. to ask me anything. Well, I, I, if you're sure. Yeah, yeah, excellent. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Well, well, thank you for that. Um, we, um, uh, there's some interesting stuff there. I, I sort of heard little, um, little mutters throughout the audience and you're going along uh, following my click trails and working out who I am and yeah, yeah. getting me to register and all those sorts of things. And everyone was thinking, bloody hell, how much do they know about me? <laughs> but uh, we, we know, of course, they know a lot, yeah, don't we? Do but thanks for that. Enough. Now, we've got one or two questions here. Um, I'll take three, and there are three hands, and then uh, get another one. Uh, Chris first. Just a couple of things, uh, right. It, what's the breakdown of populations between maximizers and satisfiers? Uh, in our population, we had had around sixty percent as maximizer, and around forty percent as satisfiers. And do you think, just to follow up, just an inch, do you think different kinds of websites? So, for instance, mm -hmm. I think I would be if it was fly fishing. Mm -hmm. I think <laughs> I. <laughs> Yeah. There's are other words for that person. Yeah. There are. <laughs> I think I would be a maximizer. Okay. But if it was buying a shirt, maybe. Mm. So do people switch? Yes. It would depend on the nature of the product category that mm. you are searching for. Mm. You have given a correct example. So what you have to do is the, your propensity to maximize will go up when the, the value of the product increases. Either the monetary value of the product increases or the utility of the product increases, utility that can satisfy your requirement. So the more it becomes important to you, the more time, the more effort that you are going to put. Mm -hmm. So it will depend on the nature of the product category. Thank you. Okay, we take both of these and then can answer well, them in one go. Answers. Okay. All okay. oh, right. Okay. So um, it, it's a, a development to that question actually, which is that um, also, I think you know uh, it's very obvious and, and clear that you could be one type of purchaser or another if you were buying energy. Mm. But if I went to, for example, the John Lewis website, mm. then depending on what the product was, mm. I could be a maximizer or satisfi yes. satisficer. So, uh, doesn't that make it really difficult for the website to customize towards my behavior? That, that's a very good question. But as I told him earlier, that your propensity to maximize will go up as the, the value of the product increases. Okay. So this kind of finding will be more useful for products or for websites which are selling high value products. Okay. Say for example, you want to buy a car. Then what you would do is you would try to get as much information as possible through the product literature number one. Then you will go to different websites to collect information, online reviews for instance, what others are saying about the car. You will talk to some users of that particular brand of car. So you will try to minimize your risk. So such kind of finding, as I said, will make more sense for websites which are selling high value product and not exactly a shirt. Okay. Yeah, yes, Raj, I'm just wondering whether um, there's an assumption in <coughs> what you've been doing about the information set that the satisficer and maximizer have at the beginning of your experiment, because it could be that they might display, for example, maximizing behavior, even though they're satisficers, because they don't know much about the product. Yes, uh, yeah, no, that, that's very important. Yeah. So that is why what we did was, because our target population was student, okay, so we chose a product which the students can really uh, understand. 
and that is why we chose laptop computers <laughs> which they know of okay they are using it every day the problem is if i choose a product which the students do not use or your target group of customers do not use so if you do not have any idea about the product then of course you will become a maximizer you will try to know as much as possible before you make your first purchase so that is why we chose a product which makes uh, sense for them uh, not, no, sorry, the lady in front of you, and I'll come to you up. That's all right. You're just in line. Um, I'm a maximizer. I hate myself. I understood that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that I'm, I'm risk averse. Is the internet, and I'm sure it is, sophisticated enough that if I'm defined as a maximizer by a website, then other companies, for example, insurance companies, can see, well, she's obviously risk averse and a worrier. Mm -hmm. Are they likely to target with advertising within that space? Yeah, if that information is shared between websites, then of course, if you are classified as a maximizer, and if that, like as I said, if that information is shared between uh, websites, then they can come up with a with an offering which will suit your which requirement. Yeah, which will be targeted to you, right? So that can be done quite easily by sharing information by uh, tracking the click stream information, the click stream data, the number of clicks that you make the amount of time you spend, the number of web pages you visit, which can be easily tracked. Okay, and then we can offer you, like as a retailer, customized things. So you can be easily targeted. <laughs> okay. um, so I, was, I mean, you talked about the two, the two groups. I was wondering whether there was any, any kind of middle ground for other groups. Like, for example, I would say I would be a maximizer until I, if, if I found something that I liked, then straight away that mm. would be it. So is there, is there any other, other classifications which might make it a little bit more complicated? Yeah, you could do that. Like you could play around with the groupings, okay? That's not a uh, problem. But as I said, the pro your propensity to maximize or satisfy <coughs> will depend on the nature of the product that you're buying. And if the product becomes extremely important for you, or you are in a hurry, you have to buy something today, you have to make a decision today, <laughs> then perhaps you'll show a different kind of inclination. On the other hand, if the product is not so important to you, like buying a shirt, buying a toothpaste, when you go to buy a toothpaste, who will search for information? Who will read all the information which is there on the pack? Okay, you will buy it on a habit. So every time you buy Colgate, next time you go to the shop, you buy Colgate, without even looking at the information. So you see, it will depend on the nature of the product category. So we cannot really generalize, but as I said, these results make more sense for websites which are selling high value items. So, the question is, uh, do you take into consideration where they're coming from? Because in a world of hundreds of different touch points, depending where you're coming from to the website, mm -hmm. it already shapes the experience. Mm -hmm. pre shaping the experience when you get to the website, did you take into consideration or they were coming solely on the website to have one one-off experience? In our study, it was like they were solely coming to our website. So like as I said, this was a new to market store, okay, which means that there is no established presence of this particular store in other media form. So the, 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 the participants or the customers do not know much about the product. Say you want to buy a laptop computer, you go to Google and type laptop computer. The first store that will come up possibly is Amazon or John Lewis or Curry's. But later on, like towards the end of that particular page, you will come across many other stores which you do not know of. So you want to find out, okay, like this is what John Lewis is offering me. I want to buy a Sony laptop. This is what they're offering me. Let me try out some unknown website to see what exactly they're offering me if I want to buy a Sony laptop. So that is how you come across to this website. So in that case, you're talking about unknown websites or new websites? Because new website takes long to index. Yes, the unknown. See, unknown website means something which you do not know of. Okay. Okay. You do not know of your yeah, like your colleague may know uh, of it, but you do not know of it. Okay. So that is an unknown website to you. Like the example which I gave, you search for laptop computers in Google, and the the retailer which comes and uh, say towards the bottom of the page and you click on that particular website. So that becomes an unknown website to you. But you want to find out what exactly they have on offer. Just a last one, promise. In terms of return investment and a return on marketing investment, is there any study saying that maximize or satisfies, a re gives the re more return or less return 
So in terms of making copies and investing Very time interesting time question. And uh, the metrics that we want to have. I, I haven't come across. But definitely that is something that I can do in, in future, okay? Like to find out. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good idea. So the return on marketing from different customer groups. That oh, could yes. be an extension. Jesus. Oops, sorry, in the middle there. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I think that probably most people in the room would say that they're a combination of the two. And I think that the, the, the situation would be would depend on the stage of the, of the purchase journey that you're at. Yeah. So, for example, I bought some electric guitars for a couple of my, for my children for Christmas. I didn't know which one they wanted. My, my seven-year-old said he wanted a white electric guitar, so I looked for a white electric guitars. Mm -hmm. So during that process, there was a maximization. I wanted to find out, get the right one, one that wasn't going to fall to bits. Mm -hmm. Once I'd chosen, mm -hmm. then it's just satisfied. So it's like, okay, where can I get that? guitar yeah. and I don't care as long as it looks like a proper site mm. and that it, you know it's got some good reviews for the site yeah. so that first process was looking for the product mm. and once you've got the product mm. you understand the product mm. you want that product mm. it's just where where to get it from yeah it's fine like so before you make that choice okay like when you when you are searching for a white guitar white electric guitar so you type that keyword white electric guitar and again there are hundreds of websites selling white electric guitar then you go to one website and then you try to understand what exactly they are <coughs> selling by a white uh, electric guitar. The size of the guitar and I don't know what the specifications of guitar are. So you are trying to get as much information as possible at the first stage of your decision making process. Then you are correct, then you are a maximizer. But once you make that, uh, once you have processed that information, perhaps at, the, at a later stage, you now you have, to, you have made some short list of brands. That these are the shortlisted brands which I want to buy then you act as a uh, satisficer. That's correct, like that, that can happen. So basically, again, the problem will remain uh, as it is. That at the beginning, if I'm a website selling uh, electric guitars, at the beginning what I should do is, I, tr I should give you as much information as possible. I would like to make my website as much interactive as possible. But once I have seen that you have shortlisted two or three different brands. Perhaps you have put them on your, uh, say, shopping cart. And tomorrow you'll come back and then make a final choice. And then what I'll do is I'll dynamically change my website design. So next day, when you come to my website again, then I will give you only those information about the three shortlisted guitars. So if I can understand you that at what stage you are in, then I can really play around with my all those tools to make it more effective for you. Then surely the, the thing to do would be for the website to offer that choice. So why electric guitars, do you want to know more, click here, yes, yes. or do you want to go straight and purchase? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you are an experienced guitar user, for instance, then of course you don't require so much of information. You have used this particular brand of guitar before, and I want to buy this brand, I am not bothered about anything else. So why should I search for information? Then you become a satisficer. You know what exactly you're looking for. So accordingly, I can customize the, uh, like the design characteristic. That is what we are trying to say. OK. Yep, sir. Mm. You talked about registration <laughs> and the <laughs> way to sort of work out which, which uh, different group you're in. Have you got any examples of sort of questions you could ask during registration? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the questions are like this. When you watch TV, do you continuously flick your channels? If you are strongly agree so we have a one to seven scale if you say that i'm i strongly agree that I, whenever i watch tv i continuously change my channel then you are a maximizer um, because you have always a, a fear that something better some <laughs> other program <laughs> <laughs> might be happening <laughs> some other type channel. Of experience. <laughs> <laughs> so again uh, there is another question that when you make a choice when you buy something do you have a sense of regret strongly agree versus strongly disagree. So if you strongly agree, then it indicates that you are a maximizer. So there are established ways to find out or to classify you as a user into one of these groups. OK, right. So, so apart from your next lecture where you will tell us where to invest our money, um, <laughs> what's, what's next on the horizon for you? Because this, um, this has given you a lot of uh, a lot of information, which seemingly deceptively simple information, <laughs> but from which one can glean obviously quite a lot when yeah, one understands yeah, yeah. the psychological profiling and uh, 
the understanding about the psychology of choice and, and, yeah. and human beings' reactions to things. So, what's next? What would you do next? Yeah. So basically, the the experiment which I discussed was more like a behavioral experiment. Okay. What you show. The next step would be to use the hard data the, or the objective data, which is the clickstream data. And then I can try to correlate between the results together. So what exactly the clickstream data is saying and what exactly the experiments are saying? Is there a correlation between them? That would be a next step. But he has given me a very good uh, like, uh, has he? Uh, well, idea. Has he? <laughs> well, um, well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for coming. Um, it's been a great pleasure to welcome you here. Some familiar faces, some unfamiliar faces. And thank you very much, thank you. Raj, for your, for your presentation. And uh, thank you all for all the questions. Thank you.